Good morning. Thank you. Firstly, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Can everyone just stand up for me, please? Yeah. Start off. So, as I just introduced, I am a rugby player, and I believe before any event that you do or any sporting event, that you should get warmed up physically, emotionally, and spiritually. So, what we're going to do is we're just going to start off by having a quick stretch. So, if everyone just gets their hands in the air, and all we're going to do is we're going to reach down to this side first. A little groan. Then that side. Ah. We're going to try to touch his toes. And then, be careful with this one. We're going to go backwards. Just be careful. There we are. So we're stretched. Now I want to get, us, um, we'll get some energy in the room. So if everyone just faces that way. If you're not near someone, get near someone. So these two on the second row, if you go next to him. Just start massaging the person in front of you, please. And I want you just to tell them, tell them if you want it um, harder or softer. Start judo chopping, judo chopping. Get into them, get them warmed up. Perfect. Now turn around, repay the favour. Nice. Keep going. Remember, harder, harder or softer, let them know. Let them know, let's get real warm here. Judo chopping, judo chopping. <laughs> Face me. So it's going to get some energy just to finish. So we've stretched, we've got physically ready. We're just going to, um, we're going to really build this energy here. So uh, when the noise gets to up here, so I'm going to, just me with my hand up, everyone's got their hands up. <laughs> we all don't need to have his hands up. So when the noise gets enough in the room, I'll clap and we'll sit down and we'll, we'll start with this journey. So I just want you to make as much noise as physically possible. Let everything out and let's get rid of this, this journey for the whole day. So let's get some noise. Go, let's go. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. So I think there's some energy in the room, which is great for the rest of the speakers. There's nothing worse than going into a room with no energy. So I'm going to take you on a little bit of a, a journey, really. And, uh, you know, it might seem quite gimmicky when, when you do something like that, but it really is important to get yourself emotionally, emotionally ready. So I'm going to take you back, because I know we don't have uh, masses of time. So I'm going to try to keep my personal story quite, quite brief and, and straight to the point, really. When I was eight years old, my parents broke up. And I don't know if any of those parents have broke up or they've been part of a breakup themselves. It can be quite a, a difficult time. And I was eight years old, my parents broke up and for some reason we decided to, to live with my dad, which going back 19 years was, was sort of unheard of. Two young boys living just with the dad. And what I started to do was, because the, the emotional stress, I guess, was I started to comfort eat and I got really big, really big, put on a lot of weight. I weighed more than my age, so eight years old, I weighed 10 stone. And I just kept comfort eating and comfort eating. At the same time, I started going into school, and I'll talk a little bit about masks that we all, because we all wear masks, whether you're a CEO of a business, whether you're, you're going to prisons a lot now, and, and prisoners have all got to have a mask. Rugby player, got to have a mask, because your job is to run into someone as hard as you can, and you've got to act tough. And whatever we're doing, we're all constantly wearing this mask. So I hid what was going on at home, and I used to go in as this really cheeky lad that always making jokes, and, you know, we're, we're really happy. Underneath, I were in turmoil, absolute turmoil. And... I started getting bullied really bad, um, physically and, and verbally. And it was a real difficult time in my life. And I guess they say that, you know, things come in threes. Um, I remember it just like it was yesterday. It was a Friday afternoon. My friend was coming around my mum's house. I went to my mum's house. I used to go on a weekend or every other weekend. And it was the first time. I think mum had just moved into a new house and I was allowed to bring my friend around for tea. And the um, teacher come up to me and says, I was really excited, I was really excited. My friend Kelsey, she was coming around. Mum, we're going to get tea on, we're going to have this like, big tea party. And the teacher just says, um, I'm really sorry, um, you're going to have to go, uh, you're going to Kelsey's instead because something's happened, happened to your mum. She'd been in a bit of an accident. And that's all they told me, so off I've gone. It turned out that my mum, as she was coming up to school to pick me up, I carried it, I spun it over, crushed all the leg and, and left her with slight brain damage. So, eight years old, dealing with my parents' breakup. Then the, the bullying, and then third, the, my mum's car crash. What ended up happening was with my mum, it led to a variety of mental health conditions, which is why I'm real passionate about mental health. You know, I call it a, a 20 year journey of mental health because that's what it's been. My mum developed severe depression, anxiety. My mum's Irish, and if anyone knows any Irish in the room, Irish have uh, got a lot of good spirit. They're passionate. My mum would be one at a party up on the table dancing. And, and all that was just completely ripped out of her. 
because she started developing um, what they believed at a time to be epilepsy. So they fed her the highest form of medication on the planet for this epilepsy for 10 years, and she just kept blacking out, blacking out. And one time again, I'm due to go to her house, and she has this blackout. And what had happened is, at my, where she lived, we're near school, so she'd put tea on. She'd gone into the front room, wait for tea, and then she blacked out, and um, I'll start burning down around her again, um, like the car crash. She was very fortunate someone had come, smashed window just like the car crash, exactly the same as if you believe in God or Allah or whatever religion or spirituality you believe in, as if a guardian angel had come, smashed window and got my mum out of this house. What further developed with my mum was this condition called need, non-epileptic attack disorder, which means my mum just drops, falls without any warning. So she'll fall, she'll a teeth will knock her teeth out, break a cheekbone, break a jaw, no signs, no signals, no nothing. She just drops and falls. Um, so when you, you know, get in a, long, a little bit later in life, you want to bring your friends out of your house, 15 year old, and you go to your mum's house and she's got a broken nose and two black eyes. It's, you know, it's quite a, a tough image, I guess. But what was real difficult is that she got passed from pillar to post. So I started looking a lot around mental health and, and really what it turned out with my mum's mind is that her conscious mind and her subconscious mind didn't work together. So all those now you'll all listen and you'll take probably 10% of this in and then you'll go home and think about it. My mum's subconscious mind can't do that, so she gets a little bit stressed. Um, everyone remembers them old computers at school when you overload it and it just shuts down. That's basically what my mum's mind does. So I started learning about this from a very, very young age and self-taught myself. And then what my dad did for me to get me through my struggles was he got me into playing rugby. So I think I believe that everyone should have a, a coping mechanism in life and whether that be drawing, running, joint at gym, playing rugby, which is quite... Um, barbaric, I guess, running into someone, it's not really that good for you, but it makes people feel good. Um, so, it were a real escape for me, you know, it were a escape, I used to go and it, it were a place where I felt significant, it was a place where I felt I could connect to people because at school I was known as like sloth, chunk, fatty, you name it, that with me at school, at rugby I was a big guy, so they give me a ball I'd score, so I felt significant in that environment. And obviously I went on to, you know, and I'll, I'll, I'll go quite quick through my rugby career, but I went on to play professionally and I remember getting bought by the Leeds Rhinos and you know we're, we're down south so you, some of you might not even know the sport of rugby league so Leeds Rhinos at the time was the, the champions, the world champions and they bought me from Salford so this kid from Ovindon where I'm from you know a, a council estate to go and playing for Leeds Rhinos and, and travelling the world and, and, and playing and, and training with these um, you know some of the world's best players was, was just unbelievable for me. The following year, after my first 10 games in first team, I took the risk to go on loan. I went down to London, spent a year in London. And when I came back, and for sometimes in life, for whatever reason, your face don't fit, just timing, you get your timing wrong. And, and that happened to me when I went back to Leeds. And for whatever reason, they got a new coach, and we just didn't, we just even didn't see eye to eye, or I just didn't fit in his plans. And he let me go. So I ended up going to my local team, Halifax, which is still semi-professional, and it's a dream I always had to play for my local team. But what ended up happening was at the end of that year, I felt I'd failed. And this was a time I felt I'd failed, so I started doing what I did when I was younger. I started comfort eating again. I put on a lot of weight, I ballooned. I broke up with my partner, I pushed her away, and, and guys in the room, when you break up with a girl, the natural reaction is to say, let's go out, let's drink, let's go find more girls, and... And what happened then is that it started to get to a point where I didn't feel like I could talk to my friends about it because it was just the same answer and that feeling I had. All I wanted to say to my friends was, I just miss this girl, you know, I feel lonely, I feel isolated. But I couldn't tell them that because their way of dealing with it that we're sort of conditioned to do is, let's go out. And one night I, um, I've gone out and when you're at Leeds, you've got to like watch how you walk, how you talk, you're under like a bit of a magnifying glass. Um, and that's what it was, so your behaviour and everything was spot on. And I'd come away from that and... I found myself on this altercation on a, a night out and I found myself in a police cell. And I remember thinking at that moment, this was the single worst point of my life. All that stuff had happened. I'd built myself up and, and got away from a certain type of environment to this, this professional environment. And, it, and here I was in, in this police cell. And that was, as I said, the single worst moment at that time. And it, this is where I come to why me, what's next? Because what I realised is that everything that bad that ever happened in my life, from small to big, I used to ask myself, why me? And a lot of you have done this. God, why me? You failed an exam. Why me? You've missed a bus. As simple as missing a bus to get somewhere. Or your train's late. And as silly as it sounds, I know some people are laughing because that's it. And you go, why me? Why me? I'm sick of this. And then 
I realised that every time I asked myself why me, this it just got tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter, and it was so, slowly crushing me. And it was just when I was sat in this police cell that this question just come to me out of nowhere. It just said, what's next? Like, you've got two options here. You keep going, why me? And you find yourself down a road that you don't want to be. Or you go, what's next? And you get yourself into a place where, where's right. So the, the short version of this is that I went on and got myself in, I bought a gym. I went into the, um, as we said, an entrepreneur. I'm always trying to do new things. I bought this gym and I got myself in complete physical condition. Got back with my partner. We'd bought a an house and cars and all this stuff we consider success. I'd, I'd gone and done that. We had nice houses, we had nice cars and, and all that things. As I said, we consider success. My missus is six months pregnant. I don't know if anyone's got asthma in the room. I don't got asthma in the room. So you heard, you heard what I was like at school, so I was a big kid, so cross country. I don't know if you do cross country, do you do cross country in Bristol? We have to go out on the field and you just run, basically. Well, I hated cross country, as you can imagine, yeah. We'd, we'd start it in period one and they'd all be clapping me in, in period five. <laughs> Honestly, like, I'd, we'd run, start running at nine o'clock and teachers used to always make an example of me because Luke never stops. He might be slow, but he never stops, he's clapping me in. <laughs> So I used to always look at the kids who had asthma and realise that they didn't have to do it. So I always used to wish I had asthma. I used to go around school trying to find an inhaler, but <laughs> obviously it didn't work. Um, so my missus rings me one day, she's six months pregnant, she rings and she says, I've got, um, I'm on my way to hospital, my inhaler's not working. They've given me a nebulizer, it's not working, so I'm going to go to hospital. So she, off she goes to hospital. And... Um, I'll give you the, the short version of the story. Basically, she gets to hospital in four years of being with my partner at that time. I'd never seen her cry, even when we broke up. Yeah, honest. All right. I just don't think she missed me. But, uh, <laughs> so she got to hospital and she's in medical assessment ward and they're checking her out. And I've gone down to the shop and as I've come back up, I've been told everything was going to be right. As I've come back upstairs, she's crying. She's holding her, a, a, she's holding her throat. She, she's, um, she can't breathe. Um, Dr. Chaperone's me, I can only describe it as like a film. She, Dr. Chaperone's me into another room and he um, just basically tells me that I kept saying, I was a baby, I was a baby, I was a baby. Just told him, your missus is critical right now. Lisa's critical. And off he goes. So I've got to ring Lisa's mum, tell Lisa's mum. And I tell, I tell her about a daughter anyway, she comes on. Um, after, after two days of intensive care unit, seven doctors sorting her out, she was fine. But the, the feeling of what of what went on there were just like not I've ever experienced before. You know, the fact that I could have just lost my whole world there in that one moment. So everyone likes shepherd's pie? Yeah. So I thought being a great boyfriend, I'm gonna go home and make her a shepherd's pie. So I go home, open cupboard, glass bowl falls out, me, millimeter from chopping my toe off, seven to ten in my toe, and I'm thinking, why me, what's next, why me, what's next? And then it came straight to me, what's next? So I go on and I go on this what's next moment. I go on and have the best season I've ever had. Again, all these, all this stuff. The single worst thing happened in my life then, and I'm rushing because I know my mate he's got these cards telling me to hurry up. So, um, and basically what happened is my um, my brother-in-law were up at my house Saturday the third of April, and um, we're having a laugh, we're having a joke. Sunday morning he goes and plays football with his friends. Sunday afternoon goes to play gym with his two-year-old daughter, my two-year-old daughter, and my missus his sister. Sunday night plays, um, goes and as he's having a laugh on Snapchat with his mates and he's on about coming to my house on the Wednesday talking about buying a house and that stuff, type of stuff. Monday morning he goes and buys a rope and takes his life, found dead Tuesday morning. No sign, no signal, no warning, no nothing. And that led me to this, four days after that, finding that. So we'd, we'd, we'd dealt with that and what happened is because that Randy's family and this was sort of me, I felt like I had to sweep up the pieces in a sense. So I went one who rang his best friend, told his, the mother of his child, rang my, rang my missus, told his best friends, I had to tell everyone. And four days after the why me, what's next started going through my head. And the what's next moment for me was finding a, creating a space where men could go and talk because it's, there's obviously a taboo uh, topic on why men will go and talk. So the what next came to me. And at first it was like, you physically can't bring Andy back, so there's no physical... You know, you can't bring him back, so it is why me, it's all why me, how can you have a what's next? Then I realised that what's next and what you're relating what's next is to what can you do next? You can't change what's gone, all you can change is what's going to be. So what I did is I went along, started this group, um, first session, nine men turned up, then 15 men turned up, then I started a campaign, some of you might have seen it, with a take a selfie like this. Within four weeks, over 100 million people had done it, and I believe that it's okay to talk, that's what it is. It's okay to talk, and that was a theory I had because this wasn't just a split-second decision, this is a lifetime of mental health. 
know, this started when I was eight years old. The fact that I'm probably very lucky that I learned to talk at eight years old. The resilience my dad had put in me, I learned to talk at eight years old. So I came up with this selfie idea. I remember having a joke with my missus and she was basically saying to me, I can't see, can't see it working. I can't see it working. I said, no, I've got a feeling it will. I just something simple. It's inclusive, whether you're six-year-old or 60-year-old, everyone can do it. And anyway, I took the selfie, put loads of filters on it, because... I don't look like good on photos, but I did on this one. <laughs> so if, any, if anyone's ever seen the photo, I actually look quite good on it, actually. So I took the photo, did it. Um, by the morning, no one had done it, and I'm thinking she's won, but believe in it, you know. So I kept hammering it away, and I was messaging people, please put one on, please put one on, please put one on, please put one on. By that night, people had started to do it. By Friday, Ricky Gervais had done it, Lab Bible had done it, and then, as I said, four weeks later, over a million people had done it. I had this belief that what we had, and I'm a big believer in why, your why, everyone has a why and believe that everyone's put on this planet for something. And I believe that actually all this stuff had happened to me. You can blame people for what's happened or you can blame them for the good that it's created. So what I believed is that my what's next now is to carry on rolling this movement out. So this movement continues to grow. We've now got um, eight clubs across the country from Hull to Lee all the way down to South Wales, Halifax. And these clubs are just going to keep on growing. And um, one thing I've realised is that thoughts equal feelings. So if you just come here really quick, pick you up because you want to start you look really happy. <laughs> so it's just, a, just it's just a really simple one. It's just something I've learned along the way. So if I start poking your chest, how do you feel? A bit grumpy. A bit grumpy. <laughs> but what I don't realise, any of that'd probably lead to anger. Eventually. Eventually, yeah. <laughs> but what I don't know is because I've got him up and you're giving him replies, I've actually left him a thousand pound outside. How do you feel now? Far better about it. Far better about <laughs> it. Please. But, I... but now as he sits back down, he's gonna be really upset because he ain't got a thousand pounds. Give him a round of applause. <laughs> so. Your thoughts equal your feelings, so every feeling that you think you've got, really, it's just come from a thought, so you, change the, you, li you, link the thought to a, you link the action to a different thought and the feeling feels a lot different. So, what's the message I've got for everyone here today? There's, I guess there's, there's two main messages. The fact that it really is okay to talk, whether you're a man, female, a young person, um, an OAP, it doesn't matter, that it really is okay to talk, and that by getting these thoughts out there, you can alter your emotions. And, the next one is, I guess, no matter what happens in life, we talk about perseverance and what perseverance is. It's that no matter what you come across, and this is my theory of perseverance, no matter what battle you come across in your life, whether how big or small you think it is, you know, that's that problem to you. Whether you miss a bus that day and you think that's really bad, or whether you lose a loved one, like, it's in perspective to you right then. And you've got a question that'll come into your head now. It's why me do a, do a sit in this moment and, and I guess, soul can carry on getting more negativity drawn to me or do I go what's next and what can I personally do next to make this situation as positive as possible so I do thank you all for listening um, and it's okay to talk <laughs>